I'd like to also thank the number of schools that are here today. We have students and faculty here from Penn State, Fleetwood, Topahawken, Kutztown, Skokie Valley, and Muhlenberg. China, uh, including the tariff issues. Can I take that? So, President Trump, I got this. Um, <laughs> President Trump is not running the China issue, so to speak. But uh, I, I mean, I know several staffers on the NSC and, and other places, and it is being run very, very well. Look, if you take a look at the losses that we're suffering with China, and um, you know what they have been doing. You know, through economic espionage, through taking U.S. technology, now through through coercion, taking U.S. customer bases, uh, you know, as well as the technology, we're getting clobbered, folks. And I could go anything from the steel industry to the solar panel industry, and show how unfair business practices, unfair in our cultural perspective, not in theirs, um, have you know something's got to be done. And the fact that it got 20 years to this date, we've got a problem. Um, tariffs might certainly aren't the only answer, but uh, it is actually putting a lot of pressure on the regime. You know, a lot more than, than is coming out publicly. So, what they need now is a face-saving way out, and I'm pretty sure if they can find it, they're going to take it. Nick, early in your um, presentation, you established the point that uh, if nationalism is to be on decline, to what do you attribute the rise of nationalism in many countries today? And, it, and second question, part of that is, it, is it a reaction to perceived threat that will you uh, you know, will ultimately uh, be overwhelming? So, uh, that I, I, I made the point right after that, that, um, that in some countries that are industrializing and growing, nationalism tends to rise with them. So depending where you are in the world, I mean, look at Europe, a lot of Europe has given up nationalism. Uh, in the United States, we build, at a people-to-people -people basis, build a lot more relationships uh, than, than you know, we had before. But in industrializing com countries, we are seeing nationalism. And over the course of 20 or 30 years, I mean, that nationalism is going to rise until they become so economically intertwined with the global system that it starts to break down the barriers yet again. So it'll be pockets of, of growing nationalism, depending on the country and its economic wealth. I think a really timely question, and we just observed, of course, the 17th anniversary of 9 11. Uh, since 9 11, has communication between the different federal agencies that would be involved with security, has it improved? And if so, how and why? I think you're well positioned to answer the question. Yeah, uh, I mean, in the late 90s, I was the Chief of Counterterrorism Operations in DIA. And, um, I mean, it was a knife fight. It was every day. I mean, I had more problems with the other federal agencies. Uh, than I ever did with the terrorists. <laughs> terrorists were easy to deal with. Um, it was it was internally, and but that's the way it was. Uh, and I will tell you, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry. It took. We had dozens and dozens of chances of literally two dozen chances of stopping 9/11. 23 that were uh, that were identified. Um, yeah. we, we had the chances, and we didn't. And the reason we didn't wasn't because we didn't have enough money. The reason was because our mentality was still in fighting a cold war, was still this incredible shred of secrecy that, um, and to be honest, I was sort of the other direction, which gets to be a very frustrating position, but uh, it's not that way now. I mean, they have, we have broken down a lot of barriers, and there's a lot more cross flow of communication. You know, I'm giving us a B now, where, you know, we, we would have failed uh, 20 years ago. So there's still some issues, you know, if you're an FBI agent, at the end of the day, you want to arrest and put people in jail, right? That's what you get paid to do. Uh, so, you know, your analysts are always second-class citizens, you're, you're, you're always wanting to arrest, 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 and intelligence isn't necessarily, necessarily played that way. So we still have a few issues to work with, but 100% better than it was. You're safer now than, than I would say you've ever been. A very specific question, I think addressing, again, what you have presented to us today. Please evaluate the significance of recent Russian and Chinese military maneuvers. And the second question with that, will the... What the heck? Who came out with that? <laughs> that was a good one. Sorry. And, and second question, will the United States ever adopt mandatory 
national identification cards? Um, so both very good questions. Uh, the first one, I'm, I'm not going to put it at a very significant one. Uh, you know, they, they, we've seen this historically every time they want to make a point. You know, they, they work together and do military operations or, you know, great. It's, it's fantastic, you know, good for them. Uh, it, it more scares Japan and uh, it more scares the people in, the, you know, in East Asia and Southeast Asia. You know, not so much for the United States. You know, there's actually a military analysis online which shows if it was a non-nuclear conflict, the U.S. Would, would pretty much shellack the rest of the world. Um, and, and it would. I mean, you have no idea how big and powerful this military is until you actually see what's out there in the rest of the world. It is. We, as a military goes, we are awesome. So I don't put too much credence in it. It's more of a political statement and, and you know, great. You know, the, the Russians hate the Chinese, and, you know, military to military. You talk with them on the side, they steal everything from us. You know? I mean, so I, I don't think it's changing that uh, that quickly. And I'm sorry, the second question again? second part of that, uh, do you, uh, will we ever reach the point where we issue a national identification card? I hope not. I'm just going to say I hope not. I think um, the best scenario that we have is to come out with state cards that have to meet uh, certain criteria, security criteria, which I think Pennsylvania is quickly trying to move towards. It's slow out of the gate. But, um, and because I'm a big one, I mean, I know the capabilities of the government, right? I lived it, I am it. Um, and I, I don't like, you know, I'm a real federalist in some sense. Okay, you really don't need to have it if the states have control of that. So I, I'm going to tell you why I hope not. Well, on a personal basis, I appreciate that, that take on that. <laughs> uh, final one, uh, we are dealing a lot with climate change and it's evolving significance. You've addressed that in part. We have an upcoming speaker on that topic. But uh, with your focus on technology, uh, will, do you think technology is really going to help us seriously to solve the climate change issues? Sure. Technology got us into this position in the first place. I mean, you know, it's simple reality. Technology can get us out. Uh, and it really depends. I mean, I've seen Air Force research labs do like, extraordinary things in ionizing the atmosphere and things like that. Just amazing um, programs and capabilities that we have. Uh, you know, our scientific community is just just phenomenal. And, you know, necessity is still the mother of invention. The more it becomes necessary, the more we'll advance towards doing it. So, honestly, I'm a real hopeful believer in that. I mean, I, I know that we have a lot of technology solutions that can be brought to lessen the impact of climate change. And maybe, you know, I mean, the Russians, decades ago, put up a gigantic mirror in space and warmed up one of their cities as a test. Think big. Mm -hmm. Could you do that? Why not? You know, why not, you know, change the, uh, change the climate? You know, we used to think that way. You know, we used to be uh, in America in the 50s and, and it, through the 60s, really used to do some extraordinary building and things that way. You need to think that way again. Well, Nicholas, thank you very much for being here. Our president is going to come on and make some formal closing remarks. Uh, and informally thinking, Nick, but I want to say something about this man. Uh, as you may know, often we're able to take the speaker in the morning, uh, as we would have been able to do today, to a high school. And speak of a high school, it really is a very significant matter, along with high school students who are here. Nick ran into a glitch in his schedule when we had it all set. This good man said, well, I can come another day. So he's making a second trip down to our area. He'll be speaking at Twin Valley on Monday afternoon. So thank you very much. Can I throw one sure. just a quick statement now? Uh, for those who might be interested, I am doing a presentation on Chinese economic espionage specifically. Uh, how they're doing that in Harrisburg. I even have a couple of flyers I'll, I'll give off to you in October. We'll be happy to get that on our website. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'd like to give you our token of our appreciation for your speech today. Thanks so a much bag. for being just with us. No. It's a bag. <laughs> <laughs> on upcoming events. On September 19th, our breakfast will be the continuing impact of environmental issues and changes in the world climate with Kathy Curran Myers and David Osgood. On October 10th, our luncheon is about North Korea with Jenny Town, who is with the Henry Simpson Center and managing editor of a publication on that topic. And October 11th and Thursday at Albright College, our breakfast is how the untapped power of women and girls can end world poverty. 
That's the International Day of the Girl, October 11th. So we'd like you to be with us for that event as well. As you can tell, we have a new website. I'd like to thank Mike Sutton for putting that website together for us. Thank you very much, and have a good afternoon.